Hello, this is Jackie Jones and this is module two of lecture number three dealing with negotiation. So this um, module is going to look at and focus on the models of negotiation, the fact that there are um, more than one ways to approach a negotiation. And again, this is all about in, in, in giving you skills that uh, you can use in your professional career. Another tool to add uh, to your toolbox, so to speak. So slide number three um, sets out four different types of models of negotiation that David Spencer um, identifies in his book Principles of Dispute Resolution. Those of you who are interested in dispute resolution, uh, the book by David Spencer is excellent um, and will give you an insight into um, this not so easy world of negotiation, given an appreciation of in fact how challenging negotiations can be. Um, of the ones that we are going to focus on in this um, lecture, it's going to be the adversarial and the principled. So adversarial is one whereby, um, you, as law students and lawyers, we feel very comfortable with this. It's rights-based or um, what you might call positional. Parties make offers concessions, but it's a bit of horse trading going on. Um, typically what happens in the court process, um, they adopt the adversarial way of negotiating. Principled is interest-based, and we're going to spend some time looking at that. What is the relationship between the various models of negotiation? Slide four just gives you a visual uh, snapshot as to how they can uh, be interrelated, what the um, outcomes can be, um, basically how the, the whole process can work. So choice of model um, is something that we as lawyers need to consider. Um, David Spencer states that um, overall he believes the principled approach to negotiation satisfies parties more so than the adversarial approach. Um, it has long-lasting um, resolutions. It looks beyond just the matter in dispute between the parties. That doesn't mean, for example, that adversarial or positional um, approaches to negotiation uh, is not useful. And in fact, at times, the combination of an interest-based approach to the uh, bigger picture can then be assisted by an adversarial negotiation on smaller items, such as if the matter in dispute is relatively small or it might be arguing over um, the distribution of contents, for example, which is certainly a regular feature of family matters. So the negotiation principles that we're going to be, uh, I'm going to talk to you about, um, adversarial, we're going to call that positional, cooperative or interest-based, and that's referred to as principled. Um, so you've got positional and principled. Um, uh, the principle is often just called interest-based. So some of you may be aware of a book called Getting to Yes by Fisher and Urey back in 1981. Seems to be such a long time ago. And in the negotiation folder, there are a number of um, video links that are from the Getting to Yes um, guys. And they are old, um, certainly I can see that. But if you take the time and the effort to to look at them and watch them, it will give you a, an understanding and an appreciation of what the various um, aspects of this model mean and how you can unpack them and apply them in a negotiation process. Four uh, fundamental elements to the um, interest base that uh, Fisher and Urey uh, determined was, first of all, separate the people from the problem. Uh, this is easier said than done. And certainly when we go into legal practice as young lawyers, I think this is one of the greatest challenges that we find is to, in fact, treat the problem, but not the person, to have that separation. 
And then the next um, fundamental element, again, it's quite tricky, is focusing on the interests, not the positions. Clients don't want to focus on interests. Clients want their position maintained and they want to negotiate from the position. So actually, once you separate the people from the problem, identify what that is, but then to get the people to actually focus on the interests that relate to the problem is another challenge in itself. My experience, um, having negotiated for many years, is that unless you put the time and effort into those first two aspects, um, in particular, identifying the interests that are associated with the problem between the parties, then you have a um, you don't have the same ability to create a wide ranging list of options. So option generation, expanding the pie is often what it's also referred to as is far more effective with the time and effort um, is spent on interests and people. And then criteria, the result um, to be based on some objective criteria for the parties that gives and promotes that win-win scenario that uh, is the, the cornerstone of an interest-based model. So let's just uh, take a moment to have a look at positional. I always um, am of the view that it's not hard to be positional as a lawyer. I think that's how we study law, we read cases that are decided, we spend time analysing um, what the evidence is, how to get evidence before the court, to look at um, the success or the winning of one side against the other. So um, people that do engage in positional negotiation tend to be um, uncompromising and rigid. Sometimes they bluff or create false issues, sometimes even intimidate. Um, it certainly is um, you know, a, an approach that can be, particularly for a young practitioner, quite intimidating. And also f from the point of view of a young practitioner, um, I think we as lawyers, and I'm, I'm sure I was the same, that you tended to drift into positional because of the uncertainty as to your own uh, experience and your own knowledge. So it is safer and it's easier to say no and to um, be rigid and not make compromises than it is to negotiate and uh, make concessions and to have a different outcome. So slide nine, it's um, easy to be difficult, easy to be non-compromising, it's easy to say no. I think that that's all about the type of negotiator you want to be and the best approach for your client. Certainly from a personal perspective, I can share with you that I certainly was, um, I thought I was quite a good negotiator when I um, litigated, you know, we sort of got outcomes that were um, in line with what the client wanted, the outcome. Um, but on reflection and looking back at now in the different style of negotiating that I now am involved in, um, I was very good at being um, intractable. I was very good at being belligerent and I was in fact very good at being able to say no, being embracing um, the positional way of negotiating. A barrister once said to me that I would never marry because I didn't have a capacity to say yes. My reply to that was of course that I didn't need to say yes, I just needed to say I do. Um, and I suppose that reflects on the fairly um, rigid approach that I had when I was in that arena of being a positional negotiator. An interest-based negotiator is in fact um, the, the total opposite in many respects because what you are trying to do is understand and explore the interests of both parties to get an outcome that satisfies both. So slide 10 just talks about the advantages and the disadvantages of the positional approach and they certainly are real. Um, some people want to and seek out a, a negotiator who um, has a reputation of being tough or who um, he, he wants to remain focused on key issues, for example. There's a perception of them being um, the one to get the better deal for them. But there are disadvantages to the approach as well as outline. So 
principled, interest-based, what does that all mean? Um, I've talked about exploring interests. I've talked about achieving a win-win situation, about expanding the pie. And that information is um, contained in slide 11 about the underlying motivation, the interests and concerns of all, not just your client, but also those of the other side. And ultimately, the, the key is to identify your client's common interests, to identify the other side's common interests, and therefore identify the mutual interests that they have. Seizing on those mutual interests, then be able to develop options that they are then both happy with. And basically from the Getting to Yes um, uh, book, there were, they advised that there were seven elements to this principled bargaining or interest-based approach to negotiation. And they're set out there on slide 12. What are some of the features? Um, flexibility. Cooperation and trust is a really good one. Um, engaged in a, an interest-based negotiation with a fellow practitioner is far more pleasant than a positional negotiation approach with a fellow practitioner. Um, certainly in the negotiations I'm now conducting, it's common that you just ring the other side, um, this is the agenda, what do you think, um, I'm having difficulty with this aspect, do we need some documentation here, um, can, we, can we work together to get an outcome for these parties? Because um, one of the focus, particularly after exploring with your client using your effective communication skills, what their objectives are, it may well be that one is to maintain a relationship with the other side. And that might be quite important for a business, for example, who has had a falling out with a particular supplier. Let's take that as an example. Um, but over the years, they've actually had a good working relationship. There's been a bit of a hitch. Um, if they can resolve the particular problem um, and then get back onto a track because an objective for one or both of them might be for that relationship to continue. Slide 14 talks about some advantages and disadvantages of the interest-based or principled approach. Um, as I've mentioned before about good long-term relationships, finding creative solutions is another key element to this interest-based approach because you're actually getting an outcome that satisfies both parties. Um, and, and, and basically that is the cornerstone of a win-win scenario. There are challenges, uh, no doubt about that, for the interest-based and principled approach. Some lawyers find it very difficult to cooperate with their opponent. Interestingly, um, I've come across a number of solicitors who um, have a, a great appreciation and from a, an intellectual point of view, embrace the notion of collaborative practice as a dispute resolution process. But once um, involved in a negotiation, find it very difficult to move away from the positional stance that they have been used to and have acted on over the years and to focus on the um, interests outcome for both parties. You might hear of an expression called the paradigm shift and it really is true with lawyers having to move away from the um, way of positional negotiating to interest-based. So I don't think it comes naturally to lawyers. When you work with mental health professionals, um, they seem to have a greater aptitude to um, exploring and unpacking issues than what we as lawyers do, as we tend to funnel and look for the legal solution based on the evidence, based on the outcome, rather than unpacking it a little bit further and in a, in a, and in a different way. Um, want to protect the position if you go to court is another um, situation that is a challenge to do an interest-based approach and, and I think that that really is basically from an educational point of view. Now some clients and some lawyers um, just want to go to court and so that is a challenge to um, engage with the other side if that's the process that they that they want to take. So what is all this um, by way of relevance for you, as I said, it's another tool for your toolbox. Um, 
Importantly though, an interest-based model is one that is fundamental to the dispute resolution processes. So if you are involved in mediation, collaboration, even a conciliation or without prejudice meetings with the respective legal representatives, the interest-based really does assist parties and lawyers, their representatives, to negotiate more effectively. the negotiation. Slide 18 I think really does sum up the interest-based or the principled model of negotiation. Whilst people's positions are clear and apparent, as in that little diagram, they're above the surface, it's the interests underneath that tend to be much larger, wider. These is what need to be unpacked because if we can satisfy the interests, which you can see are much broader than the positions, then the parties will have an outcome that they are both content with and um, should have a longevity. So when we talk about interests, it's really what do people really want, their needs, their interests, their goals, um, and how we clarify that. Important to note that interests come in two categories. There are legal and there are non-legal issues. Not only do clients not always see the non-legal issues, but this is an aspect that I think lawyers struggle with as well. So what's going on here if there is an issue about a will? Um, what, is the, what is the impact on the relationship of other members of the family? Is that non-legal issue something that needs to be considered and is of importance to the, to the client? Um, certainly in family law, Inevitably, it is the non-legal issue that is driving the problem between the parties, not the legal issue. The legal issue is one that can, in most circumstances, be overcome, but it's that non-legal issue, whether it be the erosion of trust in one form or the other, or some other issue that uh, is, is driving it. There's a challenge for interests, and that is um, clients do want to move into options. They want to tell you what they want and move straight into option generation without actually having explored it. So we need to work hard to identify the mutual interests. And in your negotiation exercise, you will be asked to identify um, both as a team and one person will be allocated a task to then work with other team members as to what is the interests of your client. But then the other side of the coin is use that opportunity to see if you can at least crystal gaze as to what could be the interests of the other side. What might they be? Having a discussion with your client, exploring, well, what might the other side actually want as an outcome? Because by able to do, by doing that, we then, as I say, I'd be able to identify common ground that we can then springboard to to developing options. Now part of the way of doing that is asking the other side questions to unpack the information that they are giving you in the negotiation. So they may make a comment about um, that, that, that there is some issue and being able to listen to what they're saying and also what they're not saying from an effective communication point of view, asking appropriate questions to get more information, to get a greater understanding as to where the other side is coming from, to then be able to work with them to the benefit of both clients. And that's the end of uh, Module 2 of Lecture 3. Thank you.